Lots okay. of candles tonight. Do that, okay? Yes, indeed. <laughs> Have a wonderful weekend, Bill Hammer. You too. Thanks. All right, happening now starts right now. And we start on this Friday morning with President Trump now denying reports that he used vulgar language during a meeting about immigration. The reported comments provoking swift and harsh condemnation from people all around the world. Mm -hmm. Good morning to you. I'm John Scott. And I'm Heather Childers on this Friday. Happy Friday to you. Very yeah, busy happy one, though. Happy Friday. It's been a busy week. <laughs> but we've got another hour of news ahead. Yeah, all things will happen, we're sure. Uh, sources reporting that the president insulted less developed and third world countries in that meeting, asking, why the U.S. let so many of, it, of their citizens in. Now, many critics calling the alleged statements alarming and racist, but the president is pushing back. John Roberts joining us now live from the White House with more on this. Hi, John. Uh, good morning to you. You know, the president is pushing back despite numerous confirmations that Fox News has gotten from people inside and outside the White House that the president referred to countries like El Salvador and Haiti, Honduras, some African nations as S-holes when he was uh, in a discussion with uh, several uh, members of Congress, including a number of senators and uh, House members on both the Democratic and the Republican sides, and they're talking about a fix for DACA. Uh, the president, again, despite those multiple confirmations, tweeting out this morning, quote, the language used by me at the DACA meeting was tough, but this was not the language used. What was really tough was the outlandish proposal made a big setback for DACA. Earlier this morning, uh, Bill Hemmer asked uh, the uh, White House advisor for strategic communications, Mercedes Schlapp, about what the president said. Let's watch that exchange. That language was not used. Well, do, do I, I was have not in the room. I was not in the room, and it was very clear that he, in his tweet, is his tweet stands, which was the language was not used. But again, multiple sources say to Fox News that when the, the, the subject was broached about these are countries that had temporary protected status for a, for a lot of people. You remember the president just rescinded that status uh, for people from El Salvador in the 2001 earthquake earlier this week. It was brought up that, well, maybe people from those countries should get priority in a visa lottery system. And that's when the president started going off about it, saying, why are we taking people from these asshole countries? Why don't we take more people from countries like Norway? A short time ago, Senator Dick Durbin, who was in that meeting, rebuffed the president's denial that he ever said those words. Listen here. He said Haitians. Do we need more Haitians? And then he went on when we started to describe the immigration from Africa that was being protected in this uh, bipartisan measure. That's when he used these vile and vulgar comments calling the nations they come from holes. The exact word used by the president, not more, not just once, but repeatedly. While the argument over the president's language no doubt will continue getting to the substance of the issue, how to fix DACA, there still seems to be an awful lot of daylight between the White House and Congress over a plan. The plan that Senators Durbin and Graham brought to the Oval Office yesterday was unacceptable to the president, who tweeted at length about it this morning, saying, quote, the so-called bipartisan DACA deal presented yesterday to myself and a group of Republican senators and congressmen was a big step backwards. Wall was not properly funded. Chain and lottery were made worse, and USA would be forced to take large numbers of people from high-crime countries, which are doing badly. I want a merit-based system of immigration and people who will help take our country to the next level. I want safety and security for our people. I want to stop the massive inflow of drugs. I want to fund our military, not do a dem defund. Because of the Democrats not being interested in life and safety, DACA has now taken a big step backwards. The Dems will threaten shutdown, but what they are really doing is shutting down our military at a time when we need it most, get smart, make America great again. Heather, what's not known at this point is after the president had that made-for-TV moment on Tuesday where he had that hour-long televised meeting with 22 members of Congress, he really appeared to get a lot of political capital from that. But, but between the, the tweet yesterday about FISA and then his comments last night about these nations and, and immigration, it's, it's unclear at this point how much of that political capital that he earned on Tuesday he has left. Heather? Well, here's what we do know. One week from tonight, we're facing that government shutdown. A lot of work to yep. get done until then. Uh, thank you so much, John. Appreciate it. Thank you. President Trump speaking with the Wall Street Journal this week, touting progress and outlining future plans nearly one year after taking office. Mr. Trump addressing a number of topics, including North Korea infrastructure and economic advancements. The president told the journal, quote, 
If you remember, the first quarter was a very low GDP when Obama's last quarter. It was the slowest growing recovery, a very minor recovery, but it's the worst recovery they've had since the Great Depression, and our country was headed in the wrong direction. We were going down. We were going down a long way. I believe if the opposing party got in, I believe the stock market would have fallen 50 percent instead of gone up to the number it's gone up. Joining me now, Glenn Hall, the chief editor for the Dow Jones News Wires. Let's talk about that for a minute, because it was just, what, six days ago, the stock market hit 25,000. Right. Today, it was tickling 26,000, 252 points away. Bunch of stocks have set all-time highs already this morning. I mean, clearly, Wall Street likes what this White House is doing. Uh, there have been a lot of signals in that direction, a lot of optimism out there. And the president in this interview with our Wall Street Journal team down in Washington made clear that he sees that as a direct result of the policies. Um, he's, he cited, for example, all the comments we've heard from various companies after tax reform was passed and how they see that benefiting the bottom line. We see Walmart talking about raising wages. We see Toyota talking about investing in the United States. He said all of those things wouldn't have happened without these advancements that uh, his agenda has brought. So why is it in John Roberts alluded to this in his report from the White House. It's sometimes two steps forward and then three steps back or maybe two steps back. Um, the president steps on his own message when things like, you know, the, referring to some of these third world countries in the way he, he is reported to have done so fires up his critics so much. Yeah, you know, this president doesn't act like a typical politician. We've all known that from the beginning, right? And this is, uh, you know, as, as uh, some would say, Trump being Trump. He's just trying to be candid and down to earth in these things, but he doesn't realize that there can be repercussions for, uh, you know, getting that blunt. Yeah, he's, he was a New, New York developer, you know? You, yeah. you use some tough language, I suppose. Uh, when you're in business meetings, you're blunt. But that's not necessarily what you want to say, the, the kinds of things you want to say when you're the president of the United States. Yeah, I think uh, we see a little bit of a disconnect there because the president is accustomed to when the, having a closed door meeting that that's a closed door meeting. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't exactly work that way all the time in Washington. And he tweeted out that he should have had uh, a recorder running at this meeting because he says he is being mischaracterized in the, in the things that he says. That's right. And in, in our interview with him, uh, he was talking about how much he wants a DACA deal to get done and how important he thinks it is um, and that he really has sympathy and support for all of these folks who have been here through no fault of their own since their childhood and how valuable the jobs are that they do in this country. So he made those points, but he also was really adamant there must be a wall. A wall must be a part of this. And he's very concerned, uh, as he mentioned in those clips, you know, uh, in, on those tweets about this issue of the lottery and how random uh, it is and not as the the strong vetting that he wants and this idea that if you have a relative in this country it makes it easier for you to get in this country he doesn't see those things as being good for the country and he wants uh, those issues to be addressed you know DACA is an issue that was left to him by primarily President Obama but also um, previous previous presidents and another one North Korea I mean those are two issues that, that previous presidents have just sort of kicked the ball down the road and and you know now he's left with these issues to deal with and uh, not everybody likes the way that he's approaching those deals but he's dealing with them. Yeah, that's what he said exactly to our Wall Street Journal team down in Washington during this interview. He said, this shouldn't be on my desk, but it was left on my desk. It should have been handled all the way back by the Clinton administration as far as he was concerned. But he said, now that it is on my desk, I'm going to get it done. And he made the point, which was very interesting, that he's been, you know, all of this sort of tough talk out in front doesn't necessarily reflect what might be happening behind the scenes. Yeah, indicated that, you know, he could get along with Kim Jong-un. He said he probably has a good relationship with him, but he wouldn't say whether he's had any direct contact with him, wouldn't deny it, wouldn't say he did. Uh, but his point was he's been really setting it up uh, so that he can have those relationships. And he was also reflecting on how Chinese President Xi has been more supportive uh, of this administration's efforts. But he calls Kim little rocket man. Kim yeah. calls him a dotard. And, and we're to believe that they can actually get along? I guess he's putting it in this context of the art of a deal, right, where you talk tough uh, and then you have negotiating power from strength. And he said, look, you see that from me a lot w regarding his tweets. He goes, but then later on, you see somebody's my best friend. That was his comment. Hmm. Well, uh, we'll see what happens. Uh, it is certainly interesting every day at 1600 Pennsylvania. Glenn Hall from Dow Jones News Service. Glenn, have a good weekend. Thank you.
Heather. Well, something else interesting happening. The uh, House passing the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, but not everyone is on board with it. Opponents saying that it allows the government to spy on Americans. Congressman uh, Doug Collins is here to break down the specifics for us. Coming up next. And chaos in California. Rescue teams searching for dozens of missing people after those deadly mudslides. What crews are up against? There's a house just right there that I know my kids used to play with those kids and the house, there's no sign of the house. It's not even there. It's hurting all of us. It's very, very heartbreaking. Well, the House advancing the renewal of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, the act authorizing surveillance of foreigners outside America. Now, supporters say that it prevents terrorist attacks. Opponents say that it violates the privacy of Americans. The House getting enough votes to advance the renewal to the Senate. And this is despite President Trump's maybe inconsistent tweets, some would say, about his own position. Press Secretary Sarah Sanders cleared it all up. Listen. The president fully supports the 702 uh, and was happy to see that it passed the House today, but he does have some overall concern with the FISA program more generally. The president doesn't feel that we should have to choose between protecting American citizens and protecting their civil liberties. He wants to do both, and that's exactly what he's going to do. And Georgia Congressman Doug Collins joins us now to talk a little bit more about this. Thank you very much for joining us, first of all. Heather, it's good to be with you. How are so, you? I'm great. So hash this out a little bit for us. Uh, exactly what is the, the FISA section that we're talking about here? Because it's not the entire thing. And that's exactly right. And I think what the, the president actually spoke of was a, was a true concern that most of us have, and that is protecting and balancing personal liberties and civil rights in the Fourth Amendment with the, the uh, awesome responsibility of protecting us from foreign attacks. And I think the 702 is dealing with foreign surveillance of actors, bad actors, who want to do us harm. Now, there are many other, se there are other sections of FISA that deal with Americans and how we deal with those, and those are things that got conflated in this mm -hmm. debate. And I think what the president was simply saying was there are, there are certain areas of FISA we need to continue to look at. I know the House Intelligence Committees and the Senate and the Judiciary Committees are looking at other sections, but on 702, what we have found is a program that worked, and we actually added in warrant protections to protect even further uh, Americans' interest well, in this. Uh, that, that's what I wanted to ask you about, because the question is specifically Americans who are basically caught in the crossfire of some of this communication. How are they protected? Well, there's multiple protections in there as far as how they are, they're, the information is used, and especially if there is an information which an American citizen or an agency wants to use it for a uh, criminal interest against an American, there has to be a warrant uh, file, which is what we have seen you know, all along. But we actually have that now into this uh, law that we passed out yesterday. That is going to be something that is a, a further protection. And again, at the same time, going back to making sure our intelligence communities can do what they need to do. One of the big uh, problems that came out of 9-11 was this siloing effect where you had each agency sort of had their own uh, intelligence gathering and no one was mm -hmm. sharing. What we don't want to go back to through either through warrant requirements or blanket warrant requirements is where that you're uh, siloing this kind of information where mo the agencies can't uh, cooperate with each other to mm -hmm. make sure that we're safe. Well, this strikes a proper balance and the questions on our liberties are always needed but also at the same time they have to be balanced with national security. I think what we have done and what the president has uh, said yesterday, I agree with, we have struck that balance and that's why we need to get this uh, continued. So it's passed. The renewal vote has passed in the House. Now it heads to the Senate. Uh, Rand Paul was on America's newsroom earlier today. As I'm sure you know, he's threatened to filibuster at this point. Um, technically, he's not going to be able to filibuster, but at the very least, he can delay the vote. Here's what he had to say about it. The grant of power is to spy on foreigners and foreign lands. I'm all for that. We need to protect our country. But we don't use the Constitution for these foreigners. We just grab up all their information. There are a lot of innocent people who are in here, and it should not be searched for American data without a warrant. All we're asking is go to a judge and uh, have some evidence to get started. Warrants aren't that difficult to get. Now, how much of a delay would happen if uh, what he's suggesting went through? 
Well, what he's suggesting is really basically what is in the bill. If they're wanting it for American purposes, for a, for a domestic issue, those are, those have to be uh, getting for a warrant. I mean, I think that's the concern. It, I think maybe semantics here is what is happening. That is what is happening as we go forward in this bill. I think the one thing that is that is interesting here is you look at this. You have to balance the the aspects of personal liberties and freedoms with the national security aspect. Look, Senator Paul can uh, make his points, and mm -hmm. I think he is. But I think the one thing that he is uh, that I think is, is lost here is that we did add a warrant protection in there for this information used for domestic uh, crime on American citizens. So there is protection built in there. And it's not, remember, this is, starts with foreign intelligence. Right. It is not directed at Americans. This section deals with the foreign side of this, not the domestic side of this. And so, and it really is sometimes it does a disservice to bring up other areas mm -hmm. and, and uh, problems with this while we're conflating it with the foreign aspect of this. Yeah, there's a lot to be done. Um, if Section 702 does not get reauthorized, what is at stake? Uh, uh, really, our national security is at stake. This is an issue that it cannot turn off. It cannot delay itself because every day there are people waking up who want to do us harm simply because we're the freest, most prosperous country in the world. They do not like us because of our freedoms and who we are. We've got to be able to have that broad range spectrum to know where those threats are, to where those on the front lines, our soldiers and our seamen, our airmen are all out there right now, depending on intelligence information at this very second to make sure that not only are they safe, but we're safe back here as well. This could not turn off. I think the president understands that. He's been a leader on this, and he understands the, the balance that needs to be struck. So I think what happened yesterday was a good uh, showing of that there's need to always be conscious of our personal liberties and freedoms, which are also issues that we're dealing with in other areas of FISA. But on 702, which is the foreign side of this, this is one that needs to be done because we can't afford this program to go dark. All right. Well, it's headed to the Senate. We'll see what happens. Uh, thank you very much for joining us and, and describing it all for us. Uh, Congressman Collins, well, thank you. Have a great weekend. It's always good to be with you. Take care. Bye-bye. President Trump's war with the media rages on, but could his critics' attacks be working against them? Our media panel with their thoughts on that. Plus, there could be another major policy shift on the horizon. We are awaiting an announcement on the Iran nuclear deal. Welcome back. We are awaiting President Trump's decision on the Iran nuclear deal. An announcement is expected later today. Now, the president must decide whether he will continue to exempt Iran from a series of tough economic sanctions or reimpose them. If the sanctions are reinstated, the U.S. would violate a deal that was brokered by President Obama. Obama, you may recall, lifted the sanctions in exchange for a rollback of Iran's nuclear development program. President Trump has called the agreement an embarrassment for the United States. President Trump, no stranger to criticism from the public and media of all stripes, many of them parts of the so-called never Trumpers, but some argue the ongoing attacks on the president could be working against the Never Trump movement's mission. Media Buzz host Howard Kurtz writing, some of the president's fiercest critics on the right are starting to recognize how their side's animosity is burning out of control. The relentless negativity of the Never Trumpers actually helps him by making his detractors seem obsessed and unwilling to credit him for just about anything. They give the president a big target, one that is widely distrusted by his base, and they can seem incredibly condescending toward the man in the White House. Let's bring in our panel. Aaron Delmore is senior political correspondent for Bustle.com. Beverly Hallberg is president of District Media DC. She's also a contributor for the Washington Examiner and The Hill as well. So uh, the title of Howard Kurtz's column, Aaron, asked this question, are never Trumpers being consumed by their own fiery denunciations? Are they? Kurtz's point is that it doesn't do the president or the Republican Party or even critics of President Trump any favors when they say every day that the sky is falling. Kurtz's point is that that only dilutes their argument. And he's saying that it leads to this idea that the bar is lowered for this president. Now, the footage that you're showing right now, that was President Trump on Tuesday meeting with lawmakers on Capitol Hill about right. a deal for DACA. And Kurtz's point is that that was a good moment for the president. He looked presidential. He looked like he belonged in that room and had a command over the 
proceedings that were going on. But Kurtz is also saying when these never Trumpers lower the bar and say that he is misfit for the presidency, they've changed the standard by which he should be judged, and that it's a disservice to their own movement. Some Republicans, Beverly, have, have warmed to uh, this president, despite the fact that, well, he was a Democrat before he became a Republican and uh, ran for the presidency. Um, but but the, the, the love affair from really either party is pretty fleeting, it seems. Yeah, for Republicans, I would say that they just didn't know what they were going to get from Donald Trump. I even think many people who ended up voting for him weren't quite sure what he was going to do. But when you take a look at his first year, I think tax reform is up there with one of his biggest achievements, as well as the nomination of Judge Gorsuch. So I think those who were never Trumpers, when they see that he's been conservative, I've seen them come out and praise him. But I think it's going to be interesting to see what happens in 2018. I think in some ways, you're going to see the president move towards more of a moderate to liberal agenda. Infrastructure is going to be a big push for him. And for fiscal conservatives, that's not the direction they want to go. So we're going to have to see what happens in 2018. So you think you think it'll be a different presidency, Beverly? Um, the, the 2017 was, was the year he sort of appealed to his base, and he may go a little different direction. We'll have to wait and see now. He did talk about infrastructure spending even in the campaign. I think part of this, he's just going to get to some of his agenda that is a little bit more moderate. But even when you take a look at what's happened with immigration reform, even some of the positions that he's taken on DACA are a little bit different than what he said in the campaign trail. I find it fascinating. And the one hour live meeting that, that he held, even some Republicans who were more moderate had to step in and say, Mr. President, we don't want to clean DACA bill. We need to make sure that we also have border security at the same time. So while he claims to be a deal maker, what I wonder is, is how much is he leading the charge versus saying, just bring me something to sign and I'll sign it. So we'll have to see where he lands because, frankly, we don't know on every issue. Even some of the president's detractors, Aaron, and, and there's probably no more vocal detractor than Joe Scarborough, the former Republican congressman who's now hosting a talk show over on uh, MSNBC. He said this week, the entire mainstream media, we are reflexive anti-Trump. So if, if the media, Aaron, can't give the president, uh, you know, credit for anything, what does that do to the message? Well, that's lumping all media into one category. And we've spoken a couple of times on this program about how there's opinion media and then there's straight media. And obviously he's speaking about just the one. But that argument that there's a group that is against the president it's something that can't be taken as a whole. But to Beverly's point, I want to point out that when the president was talking about DACA and about immigration reform, he did look like he was commanding that meeting, but he also looked like he was waffling on his principles. And that's not something that is an issue for the liberal media, the way that you want to talk about it, John. It's an issue for Republicans in his own party. It's like watching the president on Twitter the other morning reverse his stance on whether the House should or shouldn't vote for the bill reauthorizing FISA Section 702. It's like watching the president go on Twitter to talk about his mental status and to call himself a very stable genius. These are issues that don't just affect people who are against the president, people who would have preferred a different Republican candidate. Candidate. These are newsworthy items, regardless of who is in the White House. And they are items that, that he brought the attention onto himself. Right. He did. He knows that he can use the power of his Twitter feed and the power of the cameras that swirl around the Oval Office to make any story a big news story. And surprisingly, that's what he chose to do last weekend. Even in that press conference we saw at Camp David, one by one, Republican Party leaders came up and touted their accomplishments from 2017. And they should be touting them. They got a bunch of judicial confirmations through. They passed historic tax reform. Yeah. That's what the Republican in the party wants to talk about. But President Trump turned that press conference right back to a statement about his mental health. We'll see if Beverly's trip prediction comes through and uh, the White House takes a slightly, slightly different tack in 2018. Beverly Hallberg, Aaron, I'm sorry, Beverly Hallberg and Aaron Delmore. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you. Well, with the threat of a government shutdown just a week away, the White House is sending lawmakers back to the drawing board on immigration. We'll take a look at the potential path to an agreement. Plus, the window closing on rescue efforts four days after the deadly mudslides in California. The latest update on the search as families return home. Cars twisted in the houses, uh, upside down cars, um, garages falling down, houses falling down. I've never seen anything like it. Right now, authorities are identifying the 17 people confirmed dead in the California mudslides. The oldest victim, 89, 
the youngest, just three years old. Senior correspondent Adam Housley live from Montecito, California. Adam. Yeah, John, heartbreaking. That number expected to go up a little bit. Five people now missing still. That number down from 43 last night. Look at this damage to my right, though, John. There were once six homes standing in this area. There's now just one. All these boulders, all this debris was not here before Monday. We're talking about five inches of rain that brought all this down from the hillsides. As you come across, you can even see as the crews are going from house to house looking for survivors, they're also looking in debris like this, a car mangled with an, into a tree and some other debris. You can see the actual uh, piece of cloth there where they've done that famous orange X that tells you when it was checked, if there was any fatalities inside and who checked it. Uh, thankfully, there were no fatalities there. But if you keep coming across here, these spillways were all filled with water and rocks. They came roaring down, and now the rush is on not only to try to find survivors, but also to clear the area in case any rain was to come. Thankfully, right now, there's no rain forecasted uh, in the near future, but when it does come, they have to have this as clear as possible. John, look how big this boulder is. These are the type of things coming down, and they went through homes. They tore through everything. It's really hard to fathom. A lot of us here in Southern California have come to this area uh, for vacations with your family. You come visit people here. You stop here along the way to, to Santa Barbara, which is right next door. So to see this is a disaster is, is truly hard to fathom. There are crews that have come in also from all over. I've seen some from Butte County, which is about an eight-hour drive from here, that have come down to try and help. Um, but as we look, show you that house there, look at the flag out front right now, next to it, the orange uh, X as well. You can see how high on that home the mud went through. That's about four feet high. They raced through that home, tore through the side of it, and came out the other side. In fact, Keith, move his way towards me a little bit. We'll come over this way a little bit. Down here, if you look, all the way down this spillway, those were foundations. Now, there are just foundations left. There's nothing there. There were homes all the way down that direction. You can see way in the distance the debris. Some of those were once homes. Now it's a pile of rubble, in some cases, a quarter mile away. Uh, others went even further down. You can see cars all around the area, too. Um, and that's the problem uh, as they go through these areas. That's why there's still uh, people missing is because you have to look under, in some cases, under boulders. Again, the positive news, John, at this hour is last night when they gave the press conference, it said 43 people were missing, 17 dead, as young as three, unfortunately, uh, years old. And they were worried that that number of death would go up. They still say it probably is going to go up. But the good news, at least a little sliver of it, is that it's gone from 43 missing down to five. And again, John, this is what they're going to see. This uh, boil water uh, it remains in effect for anybody near here. And the entire area of Montecito, which is 10,000 people in this area, uh, is under evacuation orders, mandatory evacuation orders. We're told for at least two more weeks. In some cases, uh, the destruction is just so completely devastating that, I mean, again, this is, this is a home or was a home. That's all, all that's left. Next to it here, another home. That's all that's left. The front steps. I mean, walk over here. You can see. You can see pipes coming out. Um, you can see all sorts of metal that was once part of this rebar. I mean, if you walk up here, this was somebody's front porch. Now it's a pile of rocks, and they're piling more on top as they're trying to clear the spillway behind me. But imagine being in this home, as you get back to you, John, of water and mud this high, racing through it, in some cases, 50 miles an hour. Back to wow. you, John. And, and, and the homes are just obliterated. They're just gone. Gone. They're no longer in existence. I mean, that, that's what's left. You don't even know what it was, mm. other than there was a foundation. Unbelievable. Mm. Wow. The, the, the fury of Mother Nature. Adam Housley there in Montecito, California. Our Thanks, job. Adam. Well, President Trump rejecting a bipartisan immigration deal crafted by half a dozen senators arguing that the bill did not properly address chain migration or fund the border wall. But one of the authors, Senator Jeff Flake, says that the bill delivered on what the president has asked for. Listen. We have a, an agreement that we're the bipartisan group I'm talking about, the mm -hmm. six of us working, that we're shopping among our colleagues now. Uh, we don't want to release details until we talk to more of our colleagues. All I can say is it has to get 60 votes. We're the only bipartisan deal in town. The president asked to, you know, that was the call that he issued on the four principles, and this addresses all of them. So let's bring in Brett Baer, anchor of Special Report. Uh, Brett, I should say, as we speak here, we're going to keep an eye on the Roosevelt Room, where the president is expected to appear, make a proclamation for uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Day, and we'll take that live when he does appear right there. Uh, but in the meantime, let's talk about... Another Friday, and oh, actually, he's there right now. Let's take this live. I want to thank Secretary Carson, along with Isaac Newton Ferris, Jr., 
and the many distinguished guests for joining us here today. It's a great honor. Earlier this week, I had the tremendous privilege to join Isaac and Alveda to sign into law legislation redesignating the Martin Luther King Jr. National Historic Site to the Martin Luther King Jr. National Historic Park. The new law expands the area to protect it, and historic sites for the future. Generations of Americans are becoming so important, and this is a great honor for us and a great honor to Dr. King. Today, we gather in the White House to honor the memory of a great American hero, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. On January 15, 1929, Martin Luther King, Jr. was born in Atlanta, Georgia. He would go on to change the course of human history. As a young man, Dr. King decided to follow the calling of his father and grandfather to become a Christian pastor. He would later write that it was quite easy for me to think of a God of love, mainly because I grew up in a family where love was central. That is what Reverend King preached all of his life, love, love for each other, for neighbors, and for our fellow Americans. Dr. King's faith and his love for humanity led him and so many other heroes to courageously stand up for civil rights of African Americans. Through his bravery and sacrifice, Dr. King opened the eyes and lifted the conscience of our nation. He stirred the hearts of our people to recognize the dignity written in every human soul. Today, we celebrate Dr. King for standing up for the self-evident truth Americans hold so dear that no matter what the color of our skin or the place of our birth, we are all created equal by God. This April, we will mark a half century since Reverend King was so cruelly taken from us by an assassin's bullet. But while Dr. King is no longer with us, his words and his vision only grow stronger through time. Today, we mourn his loss, we celebrate his legacy, and we pledge to fight for his dream of equality, freedom, justice, and peace. I will now sign the proclamation making January 15, 2018, the Martin Luther King, Jr. federal holiday and encourage all Americans to observe this day with acts of civic work and community service in honor of Dr. King's extraordinary life, and it was extraordinary indeed, and his great legacy. Thank you. God bless you all, and God bless America. And with that, I'd like to ask a great friend of mine, Secretary Carson, for remarks. Then we're going to be signing the very important proclamation. Thank you very much. Ben. Thank you, Mr. President. <clears throat> it's an honor to be here today celebrating this solemn occasion. And I thank you for signing legislation to designate the birthplace, church, and tomb of Dr. Martin Luther King as a national historic park. His monumental struggle for civil rights earned these places in his life, faith, and death the same honor as Mount Vernon and that famous humble log cabin in Illinois. This April, we will observe the 50th anniversary of Dr. King's assassination. I remember so vividly that day as a high school student in Detroit. Far from silencing his dream, death wrought him immortal in the American heart. His message of equality, justice, and the common dignity of man resounds today, urgently needed to heal the divisions of our age. Today we honor the legacy of the man who marched on Washington for jobs 
and freedom, achieving both for millions of Americans of all races and backgrounds. But his legacy also calls us to remember where these ideas, equality, freedom, liberty, get their power. Our good efforts alone are not enough to lend them meaning. For by what shall I be called equal to another man? It cannot be by wealth, for there will always be one richer than me. It cannot be by strength, for there will always be one stronger than me. It cannot be by success or happiness or beauty or any other pieces of the human condition which are distributed through providence. So perhaps providence alone is the answer. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. With these familiar words, our Declaration of Independence recognizes the true author of our common dignity, one that is beyond every human law and institution. If we forget this source of our fundamental equality, then our fight to recognize it in our society will never be fulfilled. This is a truth that Dr. King carried with him from Selma to Montgomery, from a pulpit in Atlanta to the steps of the Lincoln Memorial, from a cell in Birmingham to the entire world. This year we will not remember his slang as the ending, but as a beginning, as a moment when his truth rose stronger than hatred and his cause larger than death, as a moment when he called to new life with his creator before whom all men shall one day stand in equal rank, bearing with them no riches but the content of their character. If we keep this conviction at the center of our every word and action, if we look upon our countrymen as brothers with a shared home and a common destination, then instead of meaningless words rolling off of our tongue, we will truly create one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And we're going to have a word from Pastor Isaac Newton Ferris, the nephew of Dr. Martin Luther King. President Trump, Vice President Pence, and to all assembled here, if my uncle were here today, the first thing he would say is, what are we or what are you doing for others? And that's why it was so important that my aunt Coretta Scott King returned to the Congress now about 10 years ago and asked that the meaning of the holiday be changed. We did not want the King holiday just to be a day of hero worship. As his nephew, I certainly think that he was one of the greatest Americans that we've produced. But it should not be a day of hero worship. And that's why the Congress agreed with my aunt and also made it a day of service. So that we, on that day, as a matter of fact, at the King Center, we refer to it as a day on, not a day off. It's not a day to hang out in the park or pull out the barbecue grill. Amen. It's a day to do something to help someone else. And that can be as simple as delivering someone's trash or picking up the uh, newspaper for that elderly person who can't get to the end of the driveway. Bottom line, you're doing something that benefits someone other than yourself. That's the proper way to remember my uncle and the proper way to celebrate the King holiday. So, President Trump, thank you for taking the time 
um, to acknowledge this day. Thank you for remembering that we're all Americans and on this day we should be united in love for all Americans. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. Day, Martin Luther King Jr., federal holiday 2018 by the President of the United States of America, a proclamation. Congratulations to him and to everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Thank Watching a live event from the Roosevelt Room there, the president signing a proclamation in honor of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Day. Um, and you could hear, obviously, some of the questions that were yelled there from some of the reporters. This coming on a day when the president has been accused of sending some derogatory tweets, making some derogatory statements, uh, people calling him a racist, some uh, people on other sides of the aisle, Democrats coming forward, making that claim. Uh, Brett Baer is standing by with us again, I believe. And uh, Brett, who's, of course, the anchor of Special Report, uh, you have to talk about the fact that this is happening on the day that's, uh, you know, it's been front and center in the conversation with everyone, uh, the president and racism. Sure, Heather, I, and we should point out that this was long on the schedule, that the president was going to make this proc mm -hmm. proclamation, he was going to sign this, and they were going to have some event. This just didn't, you know, rise up after the, the comment now heard around the world from the Oval Office meeting on immigration. It is quite stark, if you think about it, to listen to the questions there being yelled at the president of the United States uh, as he's leaving the room from signing a proclamation about MLK Day, uh, are you a racist, Mr. President? Um, those are the charges uh, by, by many lawmakers and opinion uh, folks uh, after that comment in the Oval Office. Just a, a point about this event. Uh, you saw Dr. Ben Carson, uh, who is the Secretary of Housing and Urban, Urban Development, deliver a very passionate speech. He's spoken about this and the plight of African Americans uh, for a long time, growing up in a, a poor Detroit inner city home to a single mother and becoming a famous nurse neurosurgeon and now Secretary of Ur Housing and Urban Development. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think the contrast is pretty stark if you think about what has happened, transpired over the last 24 hours and this event. Yeah, uh, it's it really clearly is. not over for this White House. No, and you know, as you said, this, this event had been planned previously, so it was an opportunity to focus on something entirely different, but instead we're brought back to this controversy. And there's a lot of work to be done in the next seven days. So how can we avoid a government shutdown? How can we come to an agreement on immigration and spending within that amount of time when we have all of these controversies uh, taking away the focus of the work? Well, I don't think it's going to happen. I mean, I think there's a real uphill battle for lawmakers uh, to do that. And in fact, I, it may be, just talking to sources on the Hill, an uphill battle to get a continuing resolution uh, to punt once again for the fourth time, uh, keeping funding where it is until, you know, sometime, maybe mid-February, uh, to try to tackle all of this again. Uh, I don't think that the chances went up for a broad deal mm -hmm. by next Friday by what transpired over the last 24 hours. In fact, they went down, and I think the likelihood is that there's going to be a real push for a short-term deal once again to give them more time. Yeah, that'll be four times in four months. 
Uh, Brett Bear, thank you so much for joining us. I know you have a lot of work to do. <laughs> Something else could change in the interim, but we will watch Guaranteed. you tonight, as always, on Special Report. Thank you. Thanks, Heather. President Trump signing a multi-billion dollar bill into law to help rebuild our U.S. military. But the Defense Department will lose a lot of that money if Congress does not act quickly to repeal spending caps. Our Pentagon reporter Lucas Tomlinson joins us now. Lucas? John, if the government shuts down next week, that means troops don't get paid, even those deployed to war zones. Now, if Congress does manage to pass a short-term spending bill known as a CR, that means that government will be able to pay its troops, but the Pentagon says it needs to plan for the long term. The longer a CR goes, the more damage it does. The president has already signed the National Defense Authorization Act, and it was passed by both houses overwhelmingly. So we need the $700 billion, and we're confident that the Congress will make a deal. The Speaker of the House says continued budget cuts puts the U.S. military at risk. This is actually costing us American lives. Last year, this nation lost 17 sailors aboard the USS John McCain and the USS Fitzgerald. Ready and shortfalls were serious factors in these fatal accidents, which happened on aging ships with expired training certifications. Every day that goes by without adequate funding is another day we are pushing our military past the breaking point. And it is a shameful situation. Another looming crisis is ending the budget caps put in place by Congress in 2011. If those caps are not lifted, congressional aides tell me $100 billion will be stripped from the defense budget and put President Trump's plan to rebuild the military in jeopardy. For example, the head of naval aviation told Congress last month half his 542 F-18 Super Hornets can't fly right now. And, John, the Army is flying at its lowest level in 30 years. And if these budget cuts aren't